Next presentation then, the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association. As you have probably heard, you have up to 10 minutes to present. Then there will be questions if you'd introduce yourself for Hansard, and then take it away. Good afternoon. I'm Loretta Merritt here on behalf of Oat Law, and with me is Aaron Ellis, who's also a lawyer. I have been representing abuse survivors in civil lawsuits for about the last 25 years. Most of my clients are adult men who are sexually abused as children, but I also represent a significant number of women and children as well. Oat Law strongly endorses Bill 132, and while I am not a psychologist, I have come to understand that the far most serious injuries sustained by people who are sexually assaulted are not the relatively temporary physical injuries, but rather the long-term psychological impact. And these are invisible injuries. When someone is abused, particularly as a child, who is unable to understand and process what is happening, they wrongly form the belief that they are at fault, that there is something wrong with them that this happened or that they allowed this to happen and that they are to blame. Blaming oneself is a psychological coping mechanism. And this self-blame and the shame and the fear of for example, not being believed, or fear of the perpetrator, or fear of the judicial system, prevents abuse survivors from coming forward, often for decades. The delay in coming forward works against survivors when it comes to limitation periods or time limits for suing. So at the present time, what we have is a relatively complicated set of exceptions for sexual abuse survivors. And what this means is, in civil lawsuits, a lot of time and effort is spent trying to prove things like when the survivor understood the causal connection between the assault that happened and the harm that they've experienced, or when the survivor is psychologically capable of coming forward and commencing litigation. And sometimes we need expert evidence for that. This complicates cases for survivors who do retain lawyers who are able to do the work and mount the evidence, but it also defer deters many people from even coming forward and speaking to a lawyer because they think it's too late to sue. Therefore, eliminating limitation periods in sexual abuse cases, as Bill 132 would do, it's a critical step if you want to improve access to justice for abuse survivors, and we wholeheartedly endorse these provisions in the bill. Oat Law is proposing two small changes to Bill 132. And the first is intended to make it clear that the elimination of limitation periods applies to institutions which are legally responsible for sexual abuse committed, for example, by their employees. There is no valid policy reason to distinguish between the perpetrator and the institution who is legally responsible, whether it be through negligence or vicarious liability or other legal way. In fact, if you don't include the institutions, a great number of abuse survivors will not get justice because in most cases the institution is the only one who can effectively compensate. And this leads to another related point, which is that under the Trustee Act, there is a limitation period for suing a deceased person and it's two years from the date of death. So in cases where the perpetrator is dead, some institutions argue that that limitation period under the Trustee Act affords them a defense, and this needs to be clarified. The second change needed relates to the exception in the case where the, where, uh, in the situation where the case has been dismissed. We certainly agree with the exception that if the case has been finally dismissed by a court, there, there should be no limitation, there should be a limitation period. However, Bill 132 needs to be changed to say that it is dismissed by a court order. 
And the reason for this is that sometimes cases get administratively dismissed by a registrar because an error was made. And then they're later revived and they proceed as though that never happened. So the language you have now in Bill 132 could create a loophole for these situations where a case was administratively dismissed. So all you need to do is add the words by a court order, in which case that loophole will be closed. There are a few other uh, legislative amendments that Outlaw would like to see, and most of these relate to the Victim's Bill of Rights. When someone is assaulted and forms the belief that there's something wrong with them, their lives tend to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So they cover up the shame and the blame with self-harming behaviors like alcohol and drug use, and they tend to be re-victimized. And for this reason, I'm of the view that the psychological injuries arising from sexual abuse can actually be far worse than even a devastating physical injury like losing a leg. You can recover from losing a leg. It's hard to recover from thinking you're a worthless human being. Yet, because these injuries are invisible, they're poorly understood and seriously undercompensated in our judicial system. So we are proposing amendments that would eliminate repayment of Criminal Injuries Compensation Board awards, Ontario Disability Support awards, Ontario Works, as well as the elimination of the cap on pain and suffering for sexual abuse cases, and finally proposing full indemnity costs be paid by unsuccessful defendants. One final point. One of the greatest harms from sexual abuse comes from the fact that survivors stay silent for years. And this is particularly true with children who are abused and stay silent and lose the opportunity to have an adult help them process and understand what's happened and understand they're not to blame. We're strongly of the view that legislative change is needed with respect to confidentiality agreements in civil sexual assault settlements. Sometimes, even today, defendants ask for complete gag orders in settlements. And these gag orders would prevent abuse survivors from ever talking about what happened to them. And this amounts to a re-victimization. Silencing the survivor can never be justified. And legislative action is needed in this area. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that. We have about two minutes per party. We start with the third party, Ms. Sattler. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. The, I'm particularly interested in the, uh, the final part of your presentation about the amendments to the Victims' Bill of Rights. Now, I, I'm not familiar with the legislation. It, the Victims' Bill of Rights, is that a, is that a separate act? Or? Yes, yes. It's an, it's an Ontario statute that gives victims certain rights to be informed of what's going on in a criminal proceeding, but it also relates to civil lawsuits and talks about things like the fact that there is a presumption that the defendant should pay a higher award of costs, um, creates a presumption of damages for certain types of lawsuits based on certain types of criminal offenses, including sexual assaults. Okay. So... It, that doesn't apply. There's no amendments to the, the two acts that are currently uh, referenced in this bill, uh, Compensation for Victims of Crime and Limitations Act, that would get at these issues that you uh, It would be identified. hard, other than the Trustee Act one, that could be done in Bill 132, the one where the perpetrator is dead. You could do that in the Limitations Act. Okay, so that's the only one that, that's the only amendment that could be, that, oh, no, I guess you've proposed language for the amendment around institutional defendants. Right. So the first two points I made relating okay. to court orders uh, dismissing actions as well as uh, making it clear that institutional defendants are, are caught up by Bill 132, those are absolutely squarely within 132. The Trustee Act amendment, you wouldn't have to actually amend the Trustee Act. You could put something in the Limitations Act about that to say, oh, right? But the other things I think are really something to... 
subsequent uh, legislation. Something to be done in the future, yes. Okay. Um, the, the, I'd, if you've had a chance to review all the schedules of the bill, uh, there's some, we've, it's been pointed out to us that there is some uh, variation in the definitions of sexual Ms. Sattler, violence. Ms. I'm sorry to say you're out of time. We go to the government. Ms. McGarry. Thank you very much for your very thoughtful and and very comprehensive understanding of the issue. Um, I I'm, don't even know where to begin with questioning, but I'm going to start from the very beginning. The health and physical education curriculum changes that have happened in Ontario schools this year. Are you supportive of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The sooner we can educate our children about these kinds of matters, the better. It's all about creating a space for children to come forward and disclose at a very early stage. All the science backs up the fact that it's the non-disclosure that creates the greatest harm. So anything that opens the conversation is a good thing in, in my view. And it's interesting that you, you followed that through. Uh, you should be a psychologist as well as a lawyer. I'm sure you've <laughs> heard that for now. Regarding the self-harming behaviors like uh, alcoholism and, and re-victimizing, is there much understanding uh, amongst your members, or should there be more training regarding these kinds of issues? Well, you know, I'm happy to say that as more survivors come forward and more medical studies are done and medical literature is available, the legal profession as well as the judiciary is becoming much, much more aware of these causal connections and links and new information comes forward almost on a, a weekly or monthly basis. They're now finding links between, for example, schizophrenia and childhood sexual abuse and that's something that for many years we, we didn't understand there was any connection there so it's something that's constantly evolving but uh, yes obviously there can't be enough public education on this issue and unfortunately it's an issue a lot of people just don't want to talk about and I commend you for bringing that forward what percentage of clients come after two years uh, with historical abuse would you say to uh, want to do something about come it? after like longer than two years in my practice 99% Wow. Oh yeah, I have very few current cases. Very few. It's only when the current ones are, like I say, the the, the exception. The maybe 99 and, might and be might that, be a little I'm high. Sorry to say, we're out of time with this questioner. <laughs> no, it was not, Mr. Yakubuski. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for joining us today. Just I want to want to clarify uh, a couple things. And you're the law. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so we're talking about limitations in civil proceedings, yes. there are no limitations from a criminal. That's right. Okay, so just because, I mean, I'm a, there was a huge case in my area of, a, of sexual abuse of a number of boys by a priest that went back 30 some years. That's been right. dealt with by the courts. Yes. Uh, and there was settlements. Uh, oh, yes. That was part of the uh, criminal proceedings, I suppose. And I guess what I wanted to ask, so on the gag orders, sometimes in, in settlements, there's a, an agreement, like the, the victim, uh, in order to get it dealt with quickly, right. they accept, uh, are you, were you proposing that that, sh that practice should be made illegal for right. them to accept a gag order, or just then none ever be imposed on them? Well, here's the thing. Defendants ask for it to settle the case. It's fine, to, it's fine to keep the terms of settlement confidential, the fact that they settled, how much they paid. But to silence the victim by saying you're never allowed to talk about your experience to your family, to your health care professionals, to speak out at a victim's group, that, that can't ever be justified by Paul. So, so I think they should be unenforceable legally. There should be a, a, So they should, should be made illegal. Yeah. So even if the, even if the person wants, because yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. No, but look what had, happened to Martin Cruz, right? He, he, he made that agreement. Right. Years later, could not live with it breached it, came forward, and, and look at what, we're still seeing Gord Stuckless cases today. Yes. Generations of people. I don't disagree with you. I'm just asking you from yeah. the legal perspective. Yeah, and I, how, I don't how mean we to get. Would, how we would manage that kind of thing, you know. And I get very passionate about this. Yeah, you do, <laughs> and I appreciate that, and it's great to have you here today. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. And with that, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.